Good morning, LA, and good evening to those joining us from the Netherlands. Um, this is coming to you live from the Consulate General in uh, San Francisco, the Dutch Consulate General, and um, we are with you from the 31st floor in downtown San Francisco, overlooking the city by the bay. And it's rather sunny today, as you, as you can see behind me. My name is Vincent Storiemans. I'm the Dutch Deputy Consul General here. And it's a great pleasure to uh, welcome you to this webinar on LA 2028. Um, um, we, uh, our office represents uh, the beautiful kingdom of the Netherlands in the 13 Western states in the US. And uh, currently, uh, you are now witnessing the first webinar uh, further to our, um, our uh, mission, our digital mission on sports. It's a fact-finding mission for Dutch companies and sports-related entities to see what the uh, Olympic and Paralympic Games in LA in 2028 have to offer to them and how they can help in that regard. Uh, if you were watching us from the beginning, from, from 8 o'clock Pacific time, you heard my colleague Sietze say um, it would have been better to do this I've in person. I've lost the feed on Vincent. Yeah, me too. In person is, uh, of course, always yeah, better to be, uh, to be making connections, to look each other in the eye and to, uh, to forge that, that connection that you want. However, given the current situation and given COVID-19 and the global pandemic also affecting California rather heavily, unfortunately, we decided to take a different approach and we decided to do it all digital. So that's why we're uh, joining you uh, today uh, in, in, this, in, this, in this way. Um, for our uh, American friends, our speakers, uh, it might be wise to uh, s explain a little bit about this mission. So as I said, it's, uh, it's pr the private sector, uh, there are government uh, entities joining us, and what we are doing currently is uh, exploring opportunities to work with uh, relevant partners in LA. It's a fact-finding mission, if you will. And um, if that fact-finding this week turns out to be successful, uh, we'll be uh, looking into forging a public-private partnership uh, to see whether we can indeed grasp those opportunities coming up in LA. We heard the deputy mayor uh, speaking this morning uh, who joined us from LA and she also flagged a few opportunities for, for Dutch companies. So that is what we're, uh, what we're exploring. Um, well, LA, of course, is a wonderful city. We all know that for the people who've been there and uh, we also recognize its economic potential. That is why in January of this year, we established a Netherlands business support office in LA, in downtown LA, and our colleagues Peter and uh, Daniela, who are working at Wilshire Boulevard, uh, are a keen and a, a very helpful resource also for participants in this trade mission to guide them through uh, LA and to make sure that they are able to uh, grasp opportunities there. So today's panel is very uh, distinguished, and we're extremely honored and thrilled to have them here. Um, Casey Wasserman, who's the president of the uh, Olympic Organizing Committee in Los Angeles. Thank you very much for, for joining us, Casey. We have Aaron Bromagem, who's the director of uh, Olympic and Paralympic Development in uh, Los Angeles at the city uh, of LA. And we have Maurits uh, Hendricks, who's a sports household name, I would say, in the Netherlands. And he's, uh, uh, he represents the Netherlands Olympic Committee and the Netherlands uh, Sports Federation. So uh, a warm welcome to you all, and thank you for joining us from, respectively, LA and uh, the <coughs> Netherlands. Let me share very briefly um, uh, and quickly uh, a bit of practicalities on the coming 30 minutes. So as I said, we have three uh, speakers. I will be asking them uh, a question uh, to which they can uh, respond. Those questions are relevant to participants in, in our mission. And um, after that, our speakers have an opportunity to uh, respond to each other. Uh, once uh, that has happened, uh, there's also probably some time uh, to answer questions that come in uh, through the chat box. So this is a request to you participating in the mission or watching us uh, via Twitter. Most welcome to uh, put your uh, answers in writing, send them to us, and if there's enough time in these 30 minutes, we'll be addressing those questions. So without further ado, I would like to introduce Casey, Casey Wasserman. As said, he's the, uh, the president of the Olympic Organizing Committee uh, in LA. Uh, he's also the founder and CEO of Wasserman, 
which is a sports marketing uh, and talent managing uh, company with, with its headquarters in Los Angeles. And um, he also has, if I'm not mistaken, Casey, but you can talk to that, uh, a, a branch office in Amsterdam. So that's, that's very interesting and, of course, appealing to us. Uh, well, Casey was instrumental in, and he headed the, the LA 2028 bid, uh, which was obviously successful. And currently he's the president of the Olympic Organizing Committee. So thank you very much, uh, Casey, uh, this morning for, for joining us. Um, and our question to you is, um, the motto or the slogan of the LA uh, Olympic Games is, um, LA 2028 is not about uh, what, uh, or is about what we have, not about what we're going to build. And maybe uh, you could share some thoughts and ideas you have <coughs> on uh, making these games into the most sustainable games ever. I know that is your plan. And uh, I could also, I would also be interested in hearing a bit more uh, about the radical reuse concept. Well, Vincent, <laughs> Vincent, it's a pleasure to be with you. We do have an office in The Hague. Oh, sorry. Uh, so we, uh, we are a, uh, a large football agent uh, in the market and uh, proud of our uh, operations in the country and uh, excited for the future success of Dutch football. So <clears throat> <laughs> uh, as, far as, the, uh, as far as the Olympics go in Los Angeles and, and uh, sort of what we have, L LA is unique. I, I would say that a lot of cities in the world now have lots of sports venues uh, football or whether it's football, uh, soccer or football, American football stadiums, arenas. A lot of cities have built a lot. A lot of the major cities in the world have built a lot of venues. LA has something unique, though, uh, which I think is probably unique in the world, which is two universities in UCLA and USC uh, that operate at a large scale, both 30 plus thousand students on campus. Uh, both have large uh, athletic programs uh, operating at the highest level of college athletics and both in the city center 10 miles from each other and it's really those two assets USC and UCLA combined with the breadth and depth of Los Angeles as a sporting culture that allows us to host these games so when we say we don't have to build any new venues lots of cities believe me I've been through a bit lots of cities say things like that we don't have to build any venues and then there's usually a but and a comma and then they tell you the venues they have to build which are always the most expensive like an athlete's village like a olympic stadium like the swim venue or pick pick your fill in the blank uh and in los angeles uh, our answer is none of those uh our you know the way i like to describe our our planning process is in paris today they woke up and they're obviously planning the games uh, immediately preceding us the summer games uh, and there's a part of their office that talks about all the innovative, forward thinking, sustainable, technology driven reinvention of the games, the city, facilities, operations, all those things. And there's another part of their office where they realize that they have to build an Olympic village to host 17,500 athletes four years from almost to the day from today. And they haven't broken ground. And all those people in the other corner of the office who are thinking about all the good ideas, all the interesting mm -hmm. ideas, they get thrown out the window because it's all hands on deck to build an Olympic village. And now do that with a swim stadium and go down the line, three or four or five big multi-billion dollar venues that four years is a really <clears throat> short time to build. And I like to describe in Los Angeles this morning, if we woke up, if we were allowed in our offices, um, <laughs> There would have been a part of the office that was thinking about all those same innovative, creative, sustainable, forward thinking, technology driven ideas about hosting, delivering games, uh, leaving an indelible impact on the city of Los Angeles. And then we turned around and looked outside our window because uh, we actually can and looked <clears throat> at the dorms at UCLA that if school were in session today would be housing 20,000 more than we need students feeding 20,000 students, doing cleaning and laundry for 20,000 students every day. And so when we talk about reuse, our model is we are going to rent facilities in Los Angeles, whether it's the dorms at UCLA or Staples Center or the new SoFi Stadium, which is the most expensive stadium built in the world that will host our two national football league teams or our two soccer football clubs have stadiums in Los Angeles or Dodger Stadium if baseball is in the Olympics. Pick, pick your facility 
We will rent those facilities, which by the way, important to note, are owned by private enterprises or ostensibly private enterprises, which means they have an economic uh, obligation to keep them competitive and first rate for their essentially for their same use for the month of July in 2028. And then we will have, and, uh, half July, half August, because we have we actually go over and have the Paralympics, obviously, uh, and then hand them back and they will return to their normal use. So it is a totally different paradigm. And now I would say with the with the arrival of the pandemic we're in the middle of and the forward thinking nature of the IOC and how they have changed and evolved uh, in, in their thinking, they're much more flexible, I believe, in where and when and how they're going to allow cities to deliver games. So, for example, surfing for Paris 2024 will be in Tahiti. And last time I checked, that's not that close. Uh, uh, it may be a French territory, but it's not that close. And so as we look at opportunities to expand our footprint, that will allow us to be both more economic um, or more efficient. And so when you put all those things together, uh, LA is truly unique. We literally could host the games next year. We literally are ready today. And so we spend all our time on how do we create the greatest experience for all constituents, fans, athletes, competitors, uh, Olympic family, sponsors, residents who may not even go, uh, and then leave the city much better than we found it when we got here uh, and started this process. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Casey. And it's inspiring for us as, as Dutch people to hear that you're working with what you have. You know, some people would say that we're frugal. We would just say we're smart, I, I would think. And I think our, our cultures, our business cultures uh, go well uh, together. So, uh, and it's exciting that you're uh, aware of the fact that you'll be doing this in eight years' time. That gives you uh, ample time to prepare. And, you know, uh, early bird catches the worm. So that is also our, our <laughs> motto, I would say. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Casey. Maybe um, moving on to Aaron, also touching upon what Casey said, um, the results for the people of Los Angeles. Uh, welcome, Aaron uh, Bramajam. You are the director of Olympic and Paralympic Development at, at the office of the mayor of the city of LA, Eric Garcetti. And in that role, you have a specific, a sp a specific responsibility uh, in making sure that the games uh, uh, make the city more inclusive, more resilient, more innovative, right? Not just one-off, but you, you want to make sure, and that is what you're focusing on, that the games uh, are, are worthwhile and important for everyone in the city. Uh, and I know that you have a special focus on legacy. So what is left after the games uh, have been to, to LA in eight years' time? And I know that Maurits has some ideas about that with his Olympic experience. So uh, our question to you, Aaron, uh, would be um, what are the main focus areas of uh, the city uh, in, in preparing its infrastructure uh, for the games? Uh, we could think of uh, LA River, for example, but also uh, your uh, mobility solutions or how you are working with privately owned event space uh, in the city. So maybe you would, uh, you would like to touch upon that. Sure. Thank you, Vincent. And thanks to you and the Consul General for inviting me to join you in this very innovative way. Uh, I'm thrilled to welcome everyone to Los Angeles and into this conversation on the Games. And let me take a minute to thank Casey and Moritz as well for sharing this conversation with me. Uh, it's always difficult to follow Casey, but I learn something from him every time I hear him speak. And so following him can be a very good thing for me too. So I have a very unique position in my hometown with a unique amount of lead time. And I've known from the very first day on the job that this is not the kind of job that I get to do twice, right? So I'm very excited to have this. And as Deputy Mayor, Nina Hachigian spoke earlier, she highlighted the importance that we place on creating a lasting economic and social legacy for Angelinos. And that is very real for us and for me because I remember the 1984 games. I grew up with those collector's pins and with my own stuffed Sam the Eagle. So all the stuff though is not why we as Angelinos support hosting the games so strongly. It's because we created a sense of ownership and felt the benefits of that success, of the success of the 84 games. And that success brought us the LA 84 Foundation and you know, the winning 2028 bid will bring us another new investment in youth sports, which will be 
uh, a commitment made by 2028 as well as the IOC to support programming and youth sports throughout the city of Los Angeles. And that success will also bring us innovations in traffic control and transportation. And by 2028, we'll have added new rapid transit lines as well as miles of seamless bike path along the LA River. And because we aren't building permanent venues, we can instead focus on how we connect to the ones we already have. How do we move between them, focusing on mobility? How do we better integrate smart investments into our streetscape? How do we share LA with the world as they watch at home or join us here? So as a city, our main focus is on how we can use the framework of 2028 to accelerate the goals that we already have in infrastructure, uh, goals we already have in sustainability and in equity. So on transportation projects, like the 2028 and 28 by 28 initiative and on the streets and sidewalks that will host visitors and athletes and then connecting with our neighborhoods and our neighbors in the process of doing all of that. So it's our physical infrastructure, but it's also the social legacy and social infrastructure of the game. So how do we bring local business into the supply chain for sporting and cultural events? How do, you know, both in the eight years leading up to 2028 and in the games themselves, how do we, bring volunteers and young people into this experience so that they can develop new marketable skills through their work in the games. And I mentioned that new programs like the youth sports commitment, but LA's commitments on sustainability are not gonna hinge on six weeks in 2028. Just like the rail lines that we're building and the infrastructure that we're focused on in the run up, they depend on action now. And so a future that zeroes carbon emission and waste has already begun. And that's a big part of what we call LA's Green New Deal that the mayor has led and taken to become a global Green New Deal through his role in the C40 network of mayors focused on climate action. So I mentioned that my job is unique because it's all the more rare because we also look at how to use the 2030 agenda and the 17 sustainable development goals as part of the legacy planning that we're doing. So I mentioned both sustainability and sustainable development because Mayor Garcetti understands that these go hand in hand and we must leave no one behind in the process of looking forward to 2028. So the infrastructure I'm most excited to build with our partners at LA 2028 and around this city and then around the world is the vision that we just described to bring the world to LA and LA to the world and to know that Angelinos will feel an ownership and the benefits over what will be a tremendously successful games. And we'll see that both in our infrastructure, our landscape, and in a more equitable city by 2028. Thank you uh, so much, Erin. And for us, it's really an example how a, a city can be preparing for its, its Olympics uh, this, this long ahead. And uh, just as, as a fun fact, we have someone uh, specifically tasked here at the consulate in San Francisco looking at uh, Measure M, Measure W, and the opportunities it creates and how forward-looking uh, and forward-thinking the city of LA is, is in that regard. So uh, congratulations uh, on that. Thank you so much. Um, turning to our uh, last member of the panel, uh, Maurits Hendricks. Uh, good evening, Maurits, to you in, in the Netherlands. Uh, I mentioned in my brief introduction that he's a household name in, in our country, and I think it's fair to say that he personifies uh, sports in uh, the Netherlands. So um, thinking back of 2000, when he was uh, the coach of our men's uh, field hockey team, uh, winning Olympic gold in, in Sydney, um, uh, Maurits has been uh, the uh, chef de mission for the Dutch participation in London in 2012. Uh, he had that same role in Sochi in 2014 at the uh, Winter Olympics, and he did it again in 2016 uh, in London, if I'm not mistaken. So he's uh, very well versed in... Era. Sorry? In Rio de Janeiro. Uh, in Rio de Janeiro, sorry, in Rio de Janeiro, uh, indeed. So he's very well versed in Dutch participation in uh, the Olympic uh, Games. And, um, well, thank you so much for, for joining us uh, this evening. Um, currently, he holds the role of technical director at uh, NOC NSF, which is the Netherlands Olympic Committee and the Netherlands Sports uh, Federation, uh, uh, also at, at Team NL, and he probably will say something about that, uh, that later. Maurit, so uh, as, as I explained, and you added to that rightly, so sorry for that mistake, you have a broad experience with Dutch athlete, athletes, uh, but also with the Dutch private sector. Um, and I know that the Dutch private sector always embraces uh, the Olympics, 
uh, and sees it as a true business opportunity. Uh, we all know the, uh, the Holland Heineken house, but there are a lot more ways in which we, uh, we do that. And you know uh, all about that. So maybe you could shed some light on how you think we, uh, we the Dutch, can contribute to the success of LA 2028, Maurits. Well, thank you, thank you, Vincent, and uh, thanks to Aaron and Casey for uh, for sharing their views. I think it's uh, it's a privilege for us uh, Dutch to to hear from from the two people that are are in charge of of putting this together. Uh, this, which which we look at as as a unique uh, unique bit, never before in the history of the Olympics has a, a host city been named so far in advance. Um, so so that in itself is a is a huge opportunity. Uh, if, if you look at the Dutch participation in the games, um, of course, the, the, the first thing that'll, that comes to mind is that uh, whether, whether you want to or not, but, but you'll see the Dutch during the games because there is an orange legion that is going to take hold of the city. Um, this is what we do in soccer. This is what we do to, uh, like to do in the Olympics as well. So, Casey, be prepared because uh, they're coming your way. Um, and, and we're proud of it. Uh, we're proud of it because we, we really live host city as, as Dutch. We do it as a team. And, of course, one of the things that we, we hope uh, to do is we, we hope to rack up tons of medals uh, uh, in the LA Games. But there's, there's a lot more. Um, the, the way that we embrace the Games is that we're part of a host city and we do it years in advance. We do it from a, a technical perspective of, of our performance, so we go out there years in advance, but we also like to build relationships. Of course, for our businesses, uh, uh, there's a few things that, that uh, perhaps we, we can contribute to in, in LA, um, but also to connect to the community there. Um, so that is something that we'll be looking at. And then uh, a very, perhaps very far-fetched dream, if you like, but we would like to be the country that during the closing ceremony will be handed the keys from Casey for the next uh, Olympics in, in, in 2032. So, so there's a lot for us to, to aspire to if, if you look at, at the presence. And to start off, um, we, we have developed a concept which, which we share within the Olympic family. And that is that if every nation of the 206 participating nations in, in the LA 28 games would contribute to LA in legacy, then that would be a, a tremendous uh, contribution that the, the Olympic family can do to a host, host city. And there's, there's many different things you can think of. Um, sport has such a power that uh, if every nation would come up with uh, an innovative uh, concept of how to leave something behind in LA, uh, a gift to the city. Um, I think that that's a, a concept that could really make the games uh, sustainable, if you like. So we've got a couple of ideas in that line. Wonderful. Well, I see a lot of opportunity for continuing the conversation with Erin and her team and also uh, with Casey. Um, looking at the time, I, I see a few questions coming in, but uh, I would rather ask uh, our uh, speakers to respond to each other. So the most pertinent questions will be sure to follow up on those and make sure they, they reach you and we, we ask for your, your views on that. But maybe um, to ask uh, our technical team to bring all uh, all speakers together, as, as just happened, and uh, well, invite you to, to respond what you just heard from each other, what resonates with you, what is interesting, what would you like to uh, learn more on, how can we help? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I, I'll, I'll be more than interesting to, to use, interested to use this opportunity. Uh, Casey and Aaron, for, for both of you, uh, if you look at the, the uh, pretty radical concept that, uh, that LA, LA has put forward, as, as Casey described uh, or explained to us, if you look at the challenges, um, I think it's good for us to know where you guys see uh, the big challenges coming up. Because that is perhaps uh, also uh, areas where, where Dutch uh, companies can connect. And one of the things that comes to mind is that if you look at new concepts for mobility, then uh, first of all, from, from the team perspective, Casey, of course, we, we always look at trying to minimize travel time for athletes. And, 
And LA is, is, is one of the most interesting cities when it comes to mobility because the challenges are so big with you guys. So a uh, couple things. Um, uh, it's funny that the sort of the knee jerk reaction when you tell people about the Olympics in Los Angeles, uh, and I'm sure Aaron gets the same one. The first question is always, what about the traffic? And the truth is, and I don't think it's unique to LA, it certainly happened in 84, is that traffic during the Olympics is kind of a fallacy because a few things happened. First of all, 20% uh, of the city leaves, and that's every city, everywhere on earth, every Olympic Games, they just leave. Number two, you take all the people who would normally go to an event in a car, especially in a place like Los Angeles that is such a car culture environment where they would go to a, a basketball game, one to two people in a car. I mean, the average number of people in a car in Los Angeles is less is 1.1 on a given day. So no, no one shares cars. And as you know, more it's better than I do. You've been to more Olympic games than I have. Everybody at the Olympics, fans, VIPs, teams, everyone goes in buses. And then you take all those buses and you put them in Olympic only lanes. And then you can change traffic for 17 days. You can change traffic patterns. You can't change traffic patterns permanently. Right. But in, in 1984, for example, there were only uh, trucks were only allowed on the road for deliveries between midnight and 5 a.m. So you take 20% of the people out, by the way, they're during the summer. So at least uh, in our world, that means kids aren't in school, which is always less traffic. Uh, you change the entire traffic pattern for going to events and you change the traffic pattern for the whole city. And what you have is a city just like London, as I, you know, experienced Rio, where we both were. And let me tell you, Rio is the worst traffic on earth. <laughs> and I didn't have a ton of traffic. It was, it was fine. Uh, and so actually I'm not concerned about traffic. I do think we have an opportunity to reinvent uh, what Olympic transportation does and means to, to the, the environment. I think we have an opportunity, as, as Aaron referenced, sort of to overlay technology into our traffic management systems. Um, we are building a bunch of rail lines right now that will all be done by 2028. So there's a lot that's going to evolve and change. Um, I, don't, I don't lose sleep. The one thing I would tell you as, as, as a country thinking about bidding in the vein of, of, of Los Angeles where uh, it's sort of adaptive and, and reusable to what you have as opposed to changing your city for, for the Olympics, is it changes the paradigm. So most Olympic games get in trouble because of cost, right? They become government projects managed by government executives. Not that there's anything wrong with that, but that's not their expertise is to manage multi-billion dollar construction projects and event delivery. And they, they become an excuse for urban redevelopment and master plan redevelopment of the city. And when you say what we're going to do is reuse it, therefore your cost should be quite identifiable, quite controlled. And by the way, time only makes those costs come down because we have more time for planning and we have more time for technology to, yeah. to make things more efficient. Then the risk for your delivery becomes on the revenue side. And so as I think about um, the Netherlands, the, the thing that you should be thinking about is how can the corporate and government community create an, an economic backstop you really have three revenue streams as an organizing committee. You've got your contribution from the IOC, you've got ticket sales, and, and you've got your corporate partners. And predominantly corporate partners are domestic or at best pan-European without selling pan-European rights. So you're really relying on domestic. Now, the Netherlands has a bunch of big companies, which is a really good thing because not a lot of not some countries who are maybe have more population don't have as companies as quite as big and, and as, as pervasive as, as the Netherlands does. And so how do you create a financial backstop that creates real certainty? Because you can deliver a games at all different kinds of numbers financially, but you can't do that unless you have a pretty good idea of where you can get to from a revenue perspective. So as you think forward, the more certainty you create around revenue, the absolute certainty you can create around cost, and then you can deliver the games responsibly. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Casey. Aaron, is there something you would like to, uh, to add or say? Sure. So, I mean, just to follow on to Casey's point, I mean, I think we've emphasized that using what you already have is a cost savings in and of itself, but it also creates these secondary benefits that feed directly into the legacy that we're so focused on creating, which is if you're so concentrated on delivering big buildings, you don't think about what's around them or how they connect to one another, and they become these kind of self-contained projects in, in and of themselves. And so for us, we, it really gives us a chance to step back and think about the city as a whole and how we use this opportunity in this time horizon of 2028 
to bring that connectivity together and to think really about what is the streetscape going to look like in 2028 when we think about autonomous vehicles or even aerial mobility, how is that going to dovetail with a sidewalk and a curb cut and a street light? Right. And how do we integrate those things and make it a more cohesive and compelling visual identity that becomes a new signature for Los Angeles, just the way that the palm trees were in 1932, just the way that we have created these big venues throughout the city. Now it's time for us to really focus on bringing them all together and, and creating that cohesiveness and bringing folks into that environment in a more accessible way. So I think that's really what, what is one of the benefits that we don't talk about. But when you when you go in the direction that the bid committee has gone and that the LA 2028 plan is all about, this reuse and sustainability at the core of it, right? It just brings these these secondary and tertiary benefits in terms of how you're able to use your time and to Casey's point and how you're able to use your money. Yeah, that's that's a very uh, fair and wise point. Um, actually, this is our second uh, digital mission. Uh, this this uh, fact finding mission on sports. A few weeks ago, we had a digital mission on smart and e-mobility, which is of course also a subject that ties in nicely with uh, what what LA is is doing in in preparation for the games. And for us, uh, it's very inspiring, Erin, uh, for the Dutch government at least, to see how uh, the the city government in LA is is combining the two. And I think there's a lot we can learn from each other. Um, maybe a last comment from, from, your, from, from either participant before um, I'm wrapping up. We, are, we have a lot I'm to talk excited. about in so little time. <laughs> yeah, I'm excited to talk to Moritz about his ideas on how countries can bring their presence into the city and make it part of our fabric. So we look forward to continuing this conversation and we want to thank you for including us and, and thanks to the Netherlands for being here. Thank you so much, Aaron. Absolutely, and uh, we, we would be looking forward to uh, to finding the opportunity, uh, Aaron, to visit your wonderful city. Uh, that is the that is the one thing that is missing uh, in this in this mission, so to say. So we're hoping that that opportunity will come by uh, soon. Casey, any and, famous and, last and words from you? I uh, look. I appreciate the opportunity, Marins. It's, it's wonderful to meet you. Aaron uh, and I are partners in crime, so we see each other all the time, at least virtually now, but we see each other all the time. Uh, as a proud business owner uh, of, of a company in the Netherlands, uh, it's wonderful to connect. And and I am an architecture junkie, so I do I do look forward to uh, taking some of the, uh, the Dutch flair and design ethos uh, and injecting it into sort of even some of the temporary venues we've just there's, there's so much we can do uh to make design a big part of our delivery given that we have the resources and uh excited to take advantage of such an incredible uh history and uh and uh and deliverability from from uh from, from your country and uh i hope to be back soon i miss my office i haven't been there in a while but uh, i hope to be there soon hope to see you soon Marius, would you like to uh, say something in conclusion well, there are so many topics that uh, that still uh, remain to be discussed. Uh, if you if you look at all the the possible innovations, uh, um, LA will have the opportunity, as many host cities, to uh, to choose some of their uh, specific sports that they would like to add to the program. Uh, I can only wait to hear what what Casey and Aaron uh, think of that topic. How that will uh, uh, include the city. I'm sure there, there must be tons of ideas uh, on, on that area. Um, very happy with this uh, connection, Vincent, uh, that you guys are making in this mission and looking forward to, uh, to continue this and, and, and uh, put depth to it. Excellent. Well, as everyone knows, here from the consulate in San Francisco, we stand ready to, uh, to facilitate and to accommodate and to help. And as I said, we have our Netherlands Business Support Office in downtown LA at Wilshire Boulevard, and our colleagues are also uh, very much willing to, uh, to help. So I think this will lead to, uh, to wonderful cooperation. Uh, again, I would like to thank you so much for joining us this morning. I apologize for uh, taking a bit more of your time than uh, originally planned. Eight minutes more, but I think it was well <laughs> worth it. Um, maybe one practical uh, uh, remark for our participants from the Netherlands. Uh, at uh, 9:30, we will be uh, starting again with the, uh, the the part of the, the next part of the program. So until then, you have a little coffee break, or uh, maybe uh, 
wine break uh, as it is uh, a bit <laughs> later in in the Netherlands at this uh, at this hour, um, and I um, uh, would would like to uh, thank everyone who has been watching via Twitter or other uh, ways for uh, being interested in the topic and for, uh, for 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 tuning in. So thanks everyone. Thanks to all the speakers, uh, and the, this meeting is adjourned until 9:30. Pacific time and 6.30 Dutch time. Thank you so much again from San Francisco. Bye-bye.